while people are settling in, I would draw your attention to the screen up here. There are a number of groups who are not represented here today who have participated or are participating in international and national competitions and we have assembled those groups. The largest of the groups is the Hyperloop competition for which Drexel has a number of our teams as we think of them, but it's one big Drexel team going to an event at the end of the summer and you will see a number of those Hyperloop senior design teams represented here, but there are many others as well, and we just wanted you to be aware that while today is focusing on the senior design groups that have been selected by their departments to participate in this competition, there's a lot else that's going on in senior design. And since I had your attention and you all quieted down, uh, might as well get us started. Uh, just draw your attention to the overall schedule for the afternoon. We will be hearing 10 six minute long presentations by teams from every department in the College of Engineering and the School of Biomedical Engineering this afternoon with about two minutes changeover time in each. These teams were selected by their departments to represent the department in the competition as being representative of the best of what we're doing. I think if you were to look at the range um, of what the College of Engineering and the School of Biomedical Engineering does. This is a book which we don't have enough copies to hand out, but I'm happy to share if anybody wants to look at it. This book contains 201 teams from the College of Engineering and the School of Biomedical Engineering, and 838 students have participated. Um, this is a splendid wrap-up to the education that our students have put in their heads and the projects that they've created over the typically five years that they've been here. Um, we're just getting a sample today. Uh, I should introduce myself. My name is James Mitchell. I am the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Affairs of the College of Engineering and the convener of this event. The important people here today, however, are the people in the front row. Each department nominated uh, a judge for this competition, and those judges have already been at work looking at the books that each team produced that give all of the background and the support of the calculations that lie under what you will see here this afternoon. They have selected two winners for technical merit who will be announced at the overall award ceremony which will occur in the lobby starting at 4.15. This presentation will last for about an hour and 15 minutes. And after that, we invite everybody to go out into the lobby, everybody who is either a Drexel faculty or a Drexel student can, I guess officially we say, College of Engineering or Biomedical Engineering, but probably if you're a Drexel student and just show your ID, you'll get poker chips, which you can drop in jars on each of the tables that are out in the lobby. 
those poker chips will be used in calculating a number of the awards that will be announced at 415, including a popular choice as well as a best overall. Also in the lobby, you will see in that period between approximately 2.30 and uh, 4.15, you will see in the area directly out to the back here a number of posters from freshman design groups who have been selected from around 800 students to present their design project which has lasted over the last term. The senior design projects started in the fall in which most of the groups essentially defined what the project was and then lasted through the winter when they came up with a basic solution and then is finishing now in the spring with the full-blown presentation and documentation of what they have accomplished. So that's what you're seeing, and that's the overall schedule for what we're going to do. What we're asking the senior design groups who are presenting, most of whom are over on that side of the room, you can see from the coats and ties and all of the, hey, we got to look good. Um, they will be coming up on stage here, arranging themselves and starting their presentation. And then, um, while they're setting up, the group that is finishing will come down off the stage here, and each group will receive a certificate of participation for each member, as well as one for their advisors. Um, there will also be certificates for the winners that we will be handing out at 4.15. Um, so. Right, I'm going to... First group, is this you or no? I don't think so. Okay, this is that overall schedule that I mentioned. Um, turn in your slips by 3.45 to Amy Ryman so that we can tally everything. And all the poker chips in the um, bottles, those should be put in by 3.45 as well. So, uh, it is my great pleasure to invite the first group to come up on stage um, and to get yourself ready to present. The, there are four microphones and they're under here, so you can use each of them. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the team representing the School of Biomedical Engineering, and our device is a tendon reinforcement for rotator cuff repair. So just as a brief background of a rotator cuff is a group of four major muscles and their corresponding tendons, and you can see them depicted in the pictures here on the screen. And it's used to stabilize the so shoulder joint and also to act as a cable system to position your arm in space. Unfortunately, sometimes these tendons tear, and there are over 80,000 rotator cuff repairs performed annually. However, up to 80% of these repairs fail. The mechanism of the failure is suture pull-through, as you can see here in the clip below. There are some current patches that they are used to reinforce this repair, but they're insufficient due to low mechanical strength. So, Every design has some criteria and constraints. So our major criteria was to increase 
the ultimate tensile strength of a repair. The patches I just described are able to do so for about 25%. So we wanted to meet, but hopefully exceed that percentage increase. So we followed an ASTM standard to test this for um, attended surgical repair through a random failure of mechanical testing. Our constraints is that we wanted our design to be compatible through an arthroscope. We also wanted our material to be stable in vivo, so inside the body. And we also needed our device to be biocompatible, so it limited the forward body response. Our design is a uh, two-piece hollow implantable rivet. Um, the pieces fit together and they'd be installed um, during surgery through the top and bottom of the tendon. The suture would then be threaded through the center of the rivet to provide a barrier for the forces that are experienced during normal movement to reduce this cut through. Um, this is an orthogonal view of our design to show the dimensions of millimeters and the um, parameter that we're most interested in is that center um, uh, diameter. So we went through several prototypes. We tried 3D printing ABS plastic. The tolerances were not be able to met for our design, so we scrapped that. Um, we tried uh, low density polyethylene, but they couldn't withstand the forces we applied. So we ended up with uh, 316 stainless steel, which uh, supported the forces and was easily reproducible and is common biomedical implants. So there was a sharp 90 degree angle um, that caused premature breakage of the suture. Um, we uh, addressed that by having a, a beveled edge. So to find the proper dimensions for our prototype, we created two mathematical models to describe our system. Our first model found that suture cut-through is mainly caused by a compressive stress that results from thin sutures pulling through soft tendon. Think, for example, a thin wire cutting through cheese. So in our tendon suture model below here, we show this stress as the rivet stress. So to calculate this, we look to an analogy of bolt bearing stress, where the bolt stress is inversely proportional to the bolt diameter. So since in this model, our rivet is analogous to this bolt, we find that when we increase the rivet diameter, we can decrease this rivet stress. In essence, just by changing the geometry, we can reduce suture cut through. However, increasing the rivet diameter will also create a larger hole in the tendon. So to find the maximum internal tendon stress due to stress concentrations, we can simply take the force applied to the tendon from the sutures, divide that by the remaining cross-sectional area of the tendon, and then multiply it by a stress concentration factor, Kd, which is specific to this geometry. Now, when we take both of our models and put them together, superimpose them, we can find an optimized rivet diameter where the two models intersect. We also took our limiting model, which is shown here in red, our tendon internal stress concentration, and scaled it up by a factor of two for safety, since this is destined for human use. This led us to an optimal diameter of around four millimeters. So, ultimate tensile strength testing was performed on four different constructs that we prepared, one control and three experimental. The control construct was prepared by simply threading a suture through a tendon, and the experimental construct was prepared by biopsy punching a tendon, including the rivet in either three, four, or five millimeters, and then threading the suture through the rivet. So for the control uh, construct, we came up with the ultimate tensile strength of 1.6 megapascals. This increased almost twice as much with the three millimeter rivet to 3.1 megapascals, seen by the red line. It increased further with the four millimeter rivet, and then peaked at 6.4 megapascals, the purple line, with the five millimeter rivet. And these results are really exciting and promising, and basically validate our model, our bone bearing stress model, that as you increase the rivet diameter, you're going to decrease the stress in the tendon and overall increase the strength of the construct. And it also just in general provided a support for our proof of concept design. And there you can see a picture of the rivet after uh, the testing was performed. As for clinical impact, we expect better surgical outcomes for rotator cuff repairs and specifically and importantly rotator um, revision surgeries, which are very costly and time consuming for patients who have to go through them. And this will allow people to get back to work and activity quicker, and overall, it would improve the economy. Further considerations include multiple rivets in a construct as opposed to just one, so ours will simplify. Most rotator cuff repairs use more than one suture. Also, designing a tool for implementation of the rivet for the arthroscopic cannula that is used during these surgeries. And then lastly, figuring out how to integrate the material the best way with the surrounding tissues so that it minimizes tissue death, necrosis, um, and the foreign body response. So with that, we want to thank everyone that helped us with our project, and thank you for listening.
afternoon. My name is Ricky Moore, and I have the pleasure of introducing our senior design project entitled Project Rework, the design of a 219 million 17 story office building located in Boston, Massachusetts. My team, composed of myself, Andrew Weinstein, Reed Manis, and Ryan Parker, make up sustainable resilient structures, otherwise known as SRST. As a multidisciplinary team, all members contributed equally, though all are not present today. The initial building scope provided by our client, Boston Properties, consisted of a purely architectural design. Therefore, it was necessary that all other building systems be configured. The original architectural design consisted of a 425,000 gross square foot building, which consisted of underground parking, retail spaces, 14 floors of office space, outdoor green spaces, and a mechanical penthouse. Our final design consisted of similar retail and office spaces, but we increased the gross square footage from 425,000 gross square feet to about 607,000 gross square feet through floor slab increases. Part of the mechanical penthouse was enclosed to create a rooftop cafe while the, um, oh, I'm sorry. This, our, based on the architectural design, our structural system was kept standard through a steel frame design which consisted of concrete on metal deck flooring the double concrete cores provided lateral stability while the um, existing mat foundation was, in, in, was configured with a, arc, with a hybrid foundation system, which will be discussed later on. While we kept our, our structural system standard, we chose to enhance other systems within the building. Okay, so uh, they were very strict constraints for our layout of our building. Uh, through the optimization of the, uh, the actual layout, we were able to increase the rentable space by roughly 3%. Um, and also, uh, we decided to uh, add a rooftop cafe uh, to the 17th floor mechanical penthouse area, which will give a, a beautiful view of, the, the, of Boston, as well as the Charles River. So uh, there happens to be a very unique double skin design uh, for our building. Uh, it has uh, multiple benefits, but uh, we did solar analysis first to uh, determine that the best location for it would be the, uh, the east and the west facades. And, um, so then, uh, once we decided on where to actually uh, implement it, we, uh, the benefits were, uh, there was daylight, daylight benefits, as well as uh, there's mechanical capacities, which uh, Andrew will talk about shortly, uh, as well as aesthetic benefits, will, which will help, hopefully uh, make it one of the most uh, uh, iconic buildings in, uh, in Boston. So uh, as far as the electrical system goes, uh, there's a dual utility fee, uh, which, um, helps uh, prevent prolonged power outages, as well as a mission critical system which will provide 60 hours of continuous power in the case of an outage for uh, data, util data utilities, uh, so that uh, important information is not lost. So with our proposed design for HVAC, our team was able to increase productivity of all occupants by 1.5% with a cost to benefit ratio of 1 to 20 reduce absenteeism by 28% through a higher level of filtration, and achieve a reduction of 36.9% based on energy consumption due to system choice, with a combined cooling, heating, and power providing a reduction of 4.48% to the cooling, heating, of the building. So as already said, uh, the main focus of our team was to provide a superior indoor space. Um, and the HVAC design is expanded into the three goals of providing a consistent level of thermal comfort promoting occupant health through a higher level of filtration and providing a productive building through increased individual ventilation. So first to be explored was what benefit these design choices would have in the interior space. Studies relating productivity and ventilation rate have shown that an increase of 17 CFM over the ASHRAE baseline would provide significant benefits in absenteeism as well as economically. It would also provide a projected performance increase of 1.1% in basic office tasks. In terms of the filtration literature, has also shown that the inclusion of filters for MERV 13 or higher was significantly reduced harmful indoor protective matter levels and reduced absenteeism by about 20%. So, to make the best use of these projected benefits, the team decided on the use of a dedicated outdoor system coupled with hydronic heating cooling, specifically between four and eight inch filter and ceiling panels. Um, also, included in design was a double skin facade and a combined cooling and heating and power generator. Double skin facade functioning as an end of exhaust for the ventilation. The double skin facade was one aspect of the building that was elaborated on later in the design and was a point of leverage with the architectural and mechanical disciplines. Um, it functioned as an end of exhaust for ventilation with closed radiator for 
of course, provided the means of mitigation of soil gains from glazing on exterior, uh, provided that the seasonal shading with alternating 50% and 75% per pattern, and was able to significantly reduce the heating and cooling of the building due to the function of the thermal insulator. The project location has posed a variety of challenges from a sharp building standpoint. The first challenge is that a portion of our building is candidly grouped over the Massachusetts term budget. The next challenge is the subsurface conditions. We have urban fill over top of a layer of highly compressible marine clay that has a maximum allowable deformation of less than three inches. Directly beneath lies both weather and competent bedrock, which will be important in the foundation design. SRST is elected to use a hybrid foundation system that utilizes the existing mat as well as drill chips. Our system is unique in that it uses the existing mat foundation as a continuous pile cap, whereas a traditional system would require a separate pile cap to be installed. We have further determined that the maximum column length for the building would be 5,400 kips when, when shafts are driven five feet into competent bedrock. This was determined from the output to our RAM model with a conservative factor safety of three applied to maintain a resilient design. And with that, we'd like to thank you for the consideration of our submission on the healthiest buildings in Boston. Hello, we are K4C2 Associates, and we are here to talk to you today about the redesign of Springfield High School. My name is James, this is Leonard, Nikita, Brianne, and Kayla. So the main goal of this project was to design a new high school within the constraints of the existing campus. Uh, one of the most challenging aspects of that was to balance the competing variables, such as maximizing student capacity while also minimizing the building footprint. Some of the focus areas that we analyzed were site layout, parking and traffic, Storm management as well as building systems. And because the school needed to remain operational, scheduling and logistics was also a major concern. On the next slide, you'll see our proposed site layout, which incorporated all of the ideas of the Springfield School District. We were able to incorporate five multi use fields, as well as uh, six tennis courts, regulation size track, and various parking facilities surrounding the campus. The building itself takes up approximately 107,000 square feet of the site and has a total square footage of 204,000 square feet. The classroom wings are three stories, while the uh, surrounding areas of the building are single story spaces. We analyzed several different options in order to achieve the optimal amount of parking spaces on site, and we ultimately decided on a two story precast concrete structure uh, to allow for the maximum number. In the photo on the bottom, you'll see the two highlighted intersections, which are the intersections we expect to receive increased traffic due to the relocation of the building. The goal of stormwater management is to reduce the impact of runoff on the surface waters of the Commonwealth from any new type of development. As the current high school has very limited stormwater management, low volume controls, and no water quality controls, the new site had to be designed according to EPA and DEP's requirements. We calculated that the runoff would be increased by 15.97 inch, and for quality control, we need to capture at least the first two inches off all impervious surfaces on the site. The remaining water has to be infiltrated within 72 hours. To meet these requirements, we're employing several stormwater management best practices. Um, these include our stormwater runoff capture and reuse with a cistern and infiltration bed located under the diversity turf field, as well as um, vegetated soils. The structural system of the building features a steel frame with metal decking and concrete fills supported by shallow spread footings. The design team created a preliminary steel frame and designed as you see above using RAM structural systems in accordance with International Building Code 2012. The biggest design concern for this building were the large open spaces that required no columns in the gymnasium, auditorium, and the cantilever library. Our design team 
analyze various trust systems to accommodate this need with a warrant trust with non-parallel courts selected for the gymnasium and auditorium, while a two-story Mirandale trust with typical moment connections selected for the library. The 16-foot Cantilever Library Mirandale trust was the most optimal option as it also created a great aesthetic appeal for such a significant aspect of the building as it was a heavy space, but the Mirandale gave it a lighter option. All building systems were designed to exceed the minimum codes required by IBC 2012. For mechanical, the basis of design included natural gas boilers and electric chillers connected to water sources pumped throughout the school, with, in, with packaged rooftop units serving individually zoned areas and electric baseboard heaters located in vestibules. Because this is a water-based system, a separate dedicated outdoor air system would be needed in order to meet the ventilation requirements. Several analyses were done on a geothermal system which showed that by incorporating the construction of the geothermal field into the tight schedule, it would be very beneficial for the school to include as an ad alternative. Modeling the electricity usage showed that the proposed school saved electricity when compared to the existing school. However, our design team wanted to further improve upon this, and so an analysis was done by placing photovoltaic panels above the proposed part of the garage, which could save an additional 16% on electricity. For plumbing, we realized that the minimum number of fixtures required by code was not ideal for the unique demand that school experiences, and so we decided to increase the number of fixtures in order to meet this demand. In addition, the school does not currently have a fire pump in place, and so a new diesel fire pump would need to be purchased in order to meet the demands for fire protection. The total project is estimated to cost about $131 million. Of that cost, $93 million is for construction and $6.5 million is for design, as seen in the detailed breakdown. The project has a total duration of about five years. The following simulation details the construction sequencing. Here you can see the existing site with the partial demolition occurring to prepare the site for the addition of a new track and field for students to use while the new building is being constructed. The foundation and structural system is installed in phases as seen, followed by the addition of surface parking and the building facade. The original building demolition occurs beginning with asbestos abatement, followed by the addition of, surface of a new parking garage and the athletic fields. We expect final completion to be by the end of 2020. Thank you for your time and consideration. Gas emissions with negligible benefit. 
On the other hand, the process that we design provides an economically feasible and environmentally sustainable alternative to the current wage treatment of the gas by converting this waste to liquid fuel. This plan is the first of its kind to be designed on a global production scale. All other research has only been done at an edge top scale. The bagasse will be reacted and processed to form our four main products, gasoline, jet fuel, diesel, and atmospheric gas oil. Additionally, this process produces biochar as a solid co-product. This can be used as fertilizer or a direct substitute for coal. This processing method we design produces 50,000 barrels per day of fuel products. This production rate is similar to that of a small refinery. Gas is a main raw material and is composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. The two main reactions that take place are tailgas reactive pyrolysis and hydrocracking. Tailgas reactive pyrolysis is a thermochemical decomposition of organic material at elevated temperature with the presence of gas. So the purpose of this reaction is to convert our bagasse to our bio oil. Um, the cellulose and hemicellulose in this process are converted to heavy bio oil, while the lignin is converted to biochar. After pyrolysis, the bio oil must be further treated, and this is done by the hydrocracker. Hydrocracking is um, a catalytic chemical process used to convert long hydrocarbon chains into more valuable shorter chains. So in our process, the heavy bio oil must be processed into lighter bio oils. Here you can see a simplified process schematic. First, the gas is received and must be derived from the Energy and material balances were done in order to figure out the moisture content leaving the system and the heat required that must be added to the gas. This information was used to design heat exchangers and drivers, determining the surface areas and duties. Next, the bagasse must be reacted with tail gas reactive pyrolysis to form the bio oil. The most important part of the design here is the pyrolysis resin, which is a tall, narrow reactor. The riser effluent contains syngas, bio oil, char, and water. This mixture must be separated, requiring the design of cyclones, compressors, pumps, heat exchangers, heat recovery systems, and a three-phase separator. <coughs> Next, the bio oil must be hydrocracked. Here, the most important part of the design is the packed bed reactor and all of the accompanying equipment, including pumps, compressors, vessels, and heat recovery systems. Lastly, the bio oil is separated out into products. These products are separated using a system of distillation columns, which include a crude tower and three boiled side strippers. Each product leaves the crude tower for a different stage depending on its boiling point range. This system was designed using a process simulator, and each product is then pumped and ready for sale. Overall, rigorous calculations, modeling software, and heuristics were used to size design, determine the process schematic, and the cost of each piece of equipment. The graph on this slide represents the production breakdown of the final four fuel products and their two boiling point ranges. These final products meet fuel specifications and can be sold directly or can be used in fuel blends. Here is a cumulative discounted cash flow diagram, which is the cash flow after tax and depreciation. Our production facility generates a net present value of approximately $1 billion over an assumed 20-year project lifespan. The revenue is $750 million per year, greatly surpassing both our fixed capital investment and yearly cost of manufacturing. This project adds great value to a waste material and results in a 55% discounted cash flow rate of return and a 1.3-year payback period. This economic analysis proves that our design is not only technically sound, but also economically viable. This unprecedented process technology allows the use of the, uh, uh, sorry, the um, usable fuels from waste. Additionally, we are able to, based on our economic analysis, make a significant profit each year, and this allows us also um, to have very low annual cost. As a result, the project should be pursued and the work completed provides an excellent foundation for the plant's construction as every piece of equipment has been designed and sized and all operating conditions have been determined. This would um, result also in an 
additional 3% to the global biofuel market.
At the same time, the heart rate is still on the respiratory high, or the mobile app is also 60, uh, showing 68. Because we reached the threshold, so the alarm will ring up, and then we click the button to turn it off. And then the parents can click the emergency button, they will go to the phone dial page with the number 911 input. So you just saw that our system works very well with the mobile app. However, what if there's a transmission failure between the Raspberry Pi and the mobile app? Or just for some reason, the phone is not working? Don't worry. We have also developed a local alarm system which is totally independent from the mobile app. Either the alarm, no heart rate or transmission signal loss will trigger the alarm. And once the alarm is on, there has to be someone come to press the button to turn off the alarm which means that the normal condition has already been noticed. And then we will have a local alarm demo. Here we are simulating the abnormal heart rate condition by increasing the heart rate on the ECG simulator below 80. The heart rate goes into the abnormal range, and the alarm will be triggered. We notice that, we press the button, the alarm goes off. The advantages and conveniences of which was just presented to you. I don't know about you, but for us, it doesn't even seem like a baby is being monitored for its heart rate, as opposed to this picture here. In realizing our design, we use mainly off-the-shelf components, and the estimated selling price now is $350. But we envision to shrink the system into a more compact design, and with economies of scale, we want to bring it down to $199. That is the design. These are the references, and we would also like to acknowledge the following people. We invite you to visit us at the table and witness the live demo. Thank you. Similar problems, DARPA has recently picked up interest in. 
And I'm utilizing this workflow shown here. We have developed a foundational library of image forensics algorithms. Now, these algorithms uh, detect operations such as JPEG compression, which is the most common image compression format, and other operations such as resampling, which is size, or contrast and the median filtering, as well as specific traces such as JPEG ghost and region duplication in digital images. Now, to tackle the big data problem, we implemented high performance solutions, which involve multi core CPUs and GPUs. Now, to quantify our results, uh, for example, when we take a uh, double JPEG compression detection algorithm of 1,000 images, traditional execution takes about one full day, whereas the GPU implementation takes only 16 minutes, respectively, to speed up of 95. One real world, one real world, one real world example, no, one real world, one real world example of image forgery involves a user modifying your profile picture for the sake of beauty. This is typically on online dating websites, which, which would in, this is Dr. Kamsasami's profile picture on Match.com. <laughs> now, if we apply the contrast enhancement detection algorithm to the, uh, to the profile picture, we see traces of contrast enhancement on Dr. Kamsasami's hair as indicated by the red box. The fingerprints left behind by contrast enhancement is this high frequency content as indicated by the graph here. Notice how the image where Dr. Kamsasami does not have hair we see no signs of this fingerprint, which indicates that Dr. Kanasami may have modified this image for, um, oh, by adding hair to his profile picture. This, so while we have seen a relatively humorous <laughs> example at image forging, we have to note that not all image forgings are in fact innocuous. If you look at the image of the Iranian in some text, you can fact remember and see that this image was edited for the purpose of for purpose for malicious purposes. So, so great. We can see that the image has been modified through, through just by through inspection. The two center rocket and the respective missile trip are identical. Great. We can see this visually, but well, what happens if these uh, edits aren't in fact as visual as these? So, one algorithm that we have uh, attempted to implement what is known as a region duplication detection algorithm, as outlined in the right. So, what the algorithm does is it looks for a match key point to an image, or basically a uh, region of the image which are duplicated. And what, it, and what it does is it basically matches these, uh, these regions the same as the case. If you compare the image on the right with the image on the left, you can in fact see that these images or our algorithm is able to determine that, the algorithm, that this image was in fact a forgery. So in some people, what we can say about our project to be broken up to several technical components. The main technical component for our project is essentially the fact that we developed a library of image forensic algorithms. And in addition to that, we have also developed a uh, high performance implementation of these algorithms as stated before. But also in addition to that, one more time, is we have also developed additional software which allows users to implement our algorithms or use them. So, which we will discuss later in the broader impact. So we look at the broader impact, we can break it up to four key points, an open source solution, big data, education, and government. Our main goal for the open source solution is in fact for users to be able to use and view algorithms and software Specifically, if you look at the image to the right, you can see a example software that we use, which is a straightforward call of an algorithm, specifically the contrast enhancement detection algorithm. But we also hope to attract the attention of the image forensic field, only because we believe that it can provide contributions and improvements to our library. So, with respect to government, what we want to talk about really quickly is uh, we believe that this may be applicable for the government having seen the image of the Iranian missile test. Uh, we know that for the fact that the government will need some sort of operation to do this. Thank you everyone for listening. If you want to ask any questions, please stop by our
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Engineering and Technology, Dresden University, we present our microfluidic HIV viral load monitoring chip plasma extraction.
In conclusion, we successfully created an integrated blood plasma extraction and clay acid application viral loaded microfluidic chip. It's an affordable chip costing under $4. The bioluminescence can be used to detect amplified rRNA and image with a smartphone. The design was successfully tested on both HIV and the Zika virus. And the chip is easy to use and meets requirements from the FDA for a simple test device. In closing, we would like to acknowledge these people for their help and support, and organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Our samples were tested both 1 and 24 hours. 
So these samples are our Vespolin injected samples and our BPGs at a concentration of 50 mg per mil. You can see the BPGs resulted in a 48% um, decrease in tissue modulus um, and thus increased compliance, which is significant as Vespolin is a currently available anti-wrinkle treatment. And these samples are our non-injected samples and again our BPGs at 50 mg per mil. Again, you can see that the BPGs resulted in a decrease in the tissue modulus, um, 32% this time, and both these reductions um, exceeded our target at 25% reduction. So before we get started, we can go to the next uh, We first had to tag the BPGs with a DCCA fluorescent molecule. Then we took that solution, injected that into the skin samples, uh, let them diffuse for one hour and 24 hours, embedded those samples, froze them, cryosec them on the cryosat, So these are some representative images of those that were taken on the confocal. We have our PBS control and the three concentrations of the BPGs, with both the transmitted light images and the fluorescent, the light, fluorescent images. What we did is we took these fluorescent images and we ran them through a map out code that processed the image and gave us a percent area of fluorescence for that image for one sample. Uh, this would help us look at the diffusion of the sample. Here are the results we got from the combo. And first, you can see our PBS controls are zero. That's good. And the main thing that we really want to focus on here is the samples taken at the injection site. What we can see is that over the 24-hour period, there was a decrease in the amount of BPGs that were seen in these samples, meaning that the BPGs were diffusing throughout the sample. So overall, what we can see from all this data is that the BPGs were integrating with the existing extracellular matrix in the samples and diffusing it around the injection site throughout the entire sample over this 24 hour period. So in conclusion, we have seen we for the first time demonstrated molecular engineering of the extracellular matrix skin using biomimetic proteoglycans. And the skin hydration and increased compliance caused by these PPGs offers potential for treatment of disease and aged skin against things such as tearing and the subsequent infection caused by them. And as a quick economic uh, view, inject the harvesting and injection of natural proteoglycans can cost about $300 per milligram, while using these biomimetic proteoglycans can cost around $0.06 cents per milligram. Okay, so it's a very economic Senior design team presenting the Eaton Aerospace Current Machine Design Project. My name is Matt Boyer, this is Jordan Pollock, Mickey Moorhead, Brian Bucci, and Daniel Steiner. Eaton Aerospace manufactures chip detectors using the crimping process. Chip detectors are components used in aircraft engines to monitor fuel quality. They look for the amount of metallic flex in the oil and determine if the engine needs wear or not. These are highly precise parts that cost $2,000 a piece to manufacture. Currently, they are made up of two components. A, a module that contains all the elect sensor electronics and a metallic body that houses them all, all the components and provides protection. These two parts are joined together to flange. At this flange, a force is applied that holds the two parts together, which is known as the crimping process. The crimping process is required to hold the two parts firmly together. These are the four detectors that we are tasked with handling, C, D, A, B, C, and D. As you can see, they are all different heights and different diameters, which is a design consideration we had to take into account. CDB must be held internally and CDD must be held externally because of their geometries. Currently, these four styles of chip detectors represent approximately 4,500 parts a year at this facility, but the process is scalable up to 10,000 parts a year. 
So uh, the, current, the current method of perfect process at the generic space today is the operator is required to retrieve the parts from the previous location in the assembly line, bring them over to a giant lathe like the one you see here in this picture, and then proceed to set up the lathe with a very specific set of tools specifically for that product family. Uh, after everything's set up and he goes to make the crimp, everything is done by feel and manual. There is zero feedback whatsoever, and the crimp is complete when the operator feels it's complete and sees that it's complete. So in designing our solution, we wanted to incorporate three main objectives. We wanted to make it versatile enough to accommodate all of our different part families. We wanted to incorporate lots of feedback control so that the hard data can tell the operator and the machine when everything's done. And we wanted to make it small enough to be able to fit on a bench, like you see in this picture over here. It's a full 3D CAD model, two feet by one and a half feet by one and a half feet tall. Over here we have kind of a zoomed in image of three main subsystems. We have our cable subsystem with the gripper on top that spins on pulleys. We have the tailstock that comes down and holds the part secure. And we have the two crimping arms that come in opposing each other on the x-axis to actually perform the crimp while the part is spinning inside the machine. So in order to achieve these three objectives, there are a number of innovations that we had to include in our new design to improve over the other process. Our first objective was we wanted our machine to be versatile enough to handle all of the varying shapes and sizes of different types. The first thing we did to accomplish this was we mounted our entire arc table on a vertically adjustable axis. This way we could accurately and repeatably accommodate every single part model that we wanted to. Uh, the next thing we did was we improved on the part interface mechanism. Rather than using the rigid pilot system of the lathe, which requires us to make a complicated, customized part for every product family, we use this adjustable 3D, three, three-jaw gripper mechanism that we can automatically control to open or close the interface of our parts internally or externally. Our next objective was a feedback control system. At the center of this control system is our load cell, which provides us with force data on how much force we're applying at our current interface. To control this process even further, we include a spring in line with the force sensor to act as a buffer region, so we would not apply too much force too quickly. To control it all, we use an Arduino board that would read the data from the load cell and determine when the crimp was done. This would completely automate the process, so there was no guesswork as to when enough force was applied to sufficiently crimp our parts. Our final objective was to bring it down to a bench size. Bench size. So the current process, the amount of area used to crimp the part is much larger than necessary. With our machine, we were able to efficiently lay out all of our different components to bring down that size to only what was necessary. We also eliminated all the manual controls, which saved the crimp size. Now it's as simple as the operator following this flow diagram here, when they place the part into the machine, press go, and the entire thing is done automatically without any um, interference from around. And then on to our results. So at the beginning, we did an analysis on each part to figure out how much force we needed to crimp each of them. For CBC shown here, that was 15 pounds. After repeated testing on this part, we were able to confirm the results of our analysis. To the right is a video of a test crimp on CDC. The amount of time spent crimping for our machine is comparable to the current design, but our, our machine requires almost no set of time. So in, conclu in conclusion, this project achieved the three main objectives that we set out to when we this other project was by years. First off, our machine is versatile. We can handle all four of the two vectors and it's scalable to the full 10,000 parts in the future. Two, we have feedback control with our Arduino and load cell to make sure that all the things we perform are always um, compliant. Third, we have a bench top size, which allows us to move towards the flow style production process instead of the ineffective uh, batch style process, which is currently being used. In the future, when we, when we bring this machine to the aerospace, they will be doing quality validation to ensure that the currency we give them are within their constraints. Along with that, we will be giving them operator instructions as well as design improvements so they can develop this prototype and bring it to a full um, manufacturing machine. And with that, we'll be also be including safety features to comply with OSHA. Here is a quick overview of all the aspects we applied from our five years Drexel on classes and costs. This allowed us to bring this project from concept to full completion. Thank you for your time. And Afterwards, please visit our table for a full um, print live demonstration. Thank you.
Hello, we are Sam Zagreb, 43 from the Mechanical Engineering Department. And our project is a robotic mobile platform for 3D scan for US Navy ships. I'm Tim Captain, this is Jess Lopez, Vincent Zadeo, Tyler Thomas, Ashton Kate. Our advisor for this project is Dr. John Lockenthor. So, to start with a little background, we are just to build a robotic platform that can transport a fair focus 3D scan. Fair Focus 3D is a laser scanner capable of capturing an environment and delivering detailed, computer-aided drawings as well as versus set number of reality. Um, the current method for using this scanner right now is setting it up on a static tripod, and this method requires, requires multiple personnel. Our stakeholders for this project are U.S. Navy organizations, NASA, and NAVAIR. So we broke down our design criteria in those three major areas. Uh, picking out the most important niche for mobility, we like our platform to be maneuverable on all surfaces on US Navy ships. For size and weight, we would like our platform to be fit through an area of 24 inches width, as well as be easily transported by one person. And for functionality, we like our platform to be controllable wirelessly with remote control, as well as be able to raise and lower the scanner. Six feet high. So our solution was to design a wirelessly controlled battery powered bomb platform to transport <coughs> an aero scanner for our naval ships. This solution aided in the reduction of labor hours and physical strain through the elimination of the need to carry multiple pieces of equipment and through the implementation of a zipper mask to raise and lower the scanner to desired heights at the press of a button. For the product development, with our design laid out, we were able to develop CAD and ANSYS models to better visualize and justify our design choices. From there, we reverse engineered the zipper mask supplied to us by the Navy and programmed our control systems to ensure that all needs were met. Then, we constructed a preliminary prototype made of wood to test certain components prior to constructing our final prototype, which has been thoroughly tested and optimized. So for the final design, we want to keep it lightweight. So we use 6061 quarter inch aluminum. Next on the right hand side. Uh, we covered it with 5 8 inch thick cast acrylic with two doors on the side of the, the front and back. Uh, for the drivetrain, we want to do uh, four wheel drive with 8 inch mechanical wheels powered by four 12 volt DC motors and an H bridge motor controller. We also had the zipper nest, which we designed the system around, uh, which was a patented elevation system that's acquired by from NASC, and then we had four 12 volt batteries and one 24 volt battery that powered the zipper nest. For the control system, we had an Arduino Omega with a USB shield, uh, Microsoft uh, transmitter with a controller, and then a live feedback camera with a servo motor to rotate it. So as you've seen, we've created uh, 3D pad models for this design, and it's been done to determine the arrangement of the components and test modes and with these models, we were able to finalize our dimensions. Additionally, we created a finite element model of our zipper mask component. This was done to determine the structural integrity of that piece when it was deployed to a height of six feet and under standard ship conditions. Uh, the stresses can be seen here, and they were determined to be not critical. So based on these models, we were able to create our final prototype. This prototype uh, performed all crucial functionality we set out for at the beginning of this project, including traversing over multiple surfaces in varying directions. The unit was primarily fabricated in the Drexel machine shop here, and we utilized open source software in the programming of the control systems. And as you can see here, we have an open and closed uh, views of the final prototype. After the completion of manufacturing for the prototype, we began testing to determine the success of the design. The table here shows the different areas for concern and the criteria for evaluation. Most of the testing was qualitative, including the functionality, control systems, and traction categories. This is represented by the pass-fail. The electrical systems, including the batteries, however, were tested for duration and were not pass-fail. After completion, the testing was a success. The functionality of the wheels with the rollers over the greatest surface exceeded expectations, 
as well as the integration of the zipper mask and the Microsoft Xbox components together. Additionally, the camera feedback for the servo motor mount was also successful. Some of the areas for optimization include the 12 volt battery circuit, as well as ultrasonic sonar and limit switches for the zipper mask. It is our recommendation that these features be included in future work to further optimize the design. An accelerometer will measure stability and alert for unsafe orientation of the unit. This will prevent damage to the ferrofocus scanner. <laughs> Additionally, a braking system will also prevent unwanted movement, which could further damage the scanner, and it could also inhibit the data collected during the scan. Lastly, looking at the ultrasonic proximity sensors for sonar detection, this will help with coordination of movement and ultimately autonomous control. We would like to thank everyone for their time and coming out to support all the senior design projects.